to Love, Light, and Healing with Colette Lopane Capella. I am Colette Lopane Capella, a holistic psychotherapist and Reiki practitioner and group owner of private practice New Day Vitality. I am so, so excited to bring this show to the local community and branch outward. Um, we've been doing this show for a couple of years now, and it's transitioned and changed. We're not live in person, although we're live on your TV, on your phone, um, on your computer, but we're doing this Zoom, so we're just adjusting a little. Um, this show is to bring together the mind, body, and soul, um, and each week we bring on a different expert who is going to feed us some of their knowledge, share some information and wisdom. Today, I am so, so, so excited. Um, this is the second time I get to have Joel on the show, who is um, a dear friend and colleague and um, someone I absolutely adore, fantastic at what he does, um, it, on for today. And so Joel Jar is my go-to. He's the guy's guy's therapist. He's also the couples therapist, fantastic. Um, and he also has a private practice. So I'm going to throw the ball in your court so you can introduce yourself and share some information about you to the viewers. Welcome, Joel. Thank you, Colette. Thank, thank you again for having me. Uh, much appreciated. And thanks for the lovely introduction. Yeah, just, just to add on to what you said, I, I uh, basically ha I have a private practice. Right now I'm working remotely. We're gonna revisit that you know, with the new year, but uh, I do have an office in Irvington, New York, which is a suburb in Westchester County. And uh, yes, I do specialize in, in men's issues, couples issues, and kind of runs a gamut. I also do uh, sports psychology and I incorporate yep. different modalities within that, uh, specifically hypnosis. That's one of my, my go-tos. I and forgot to mention that, I'm sorry. Oh, please, no, not a problem. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this interview and. Uh, just kudos to Colette for organizing this and uh, thanks again. Thank you, Joel. So we're going to jump right in. I'm gonna ask you some questions and I feel like the first one is so appropriate for timing. Um, right. The holidays are literally right around the corner. I can't believe right. how quickly it's coming. Um, right. But what are some of the main strategies you suggest in coping with the upcoming holidays? Absolutely. Well, we, we did pass a, a few milestones up leading up to this interview, specifically Thanksgiving. So hopefully this can apply to people who have issues with Thanksgiving for 2022. And hopefully it'll be a different, a different environment at that point, different vibe, mm -hmm. uh, which leads into my next point around COVID specifically. So I think this has to be tailored a little bit differently if we would have had the discussion two, three years ago. Um, so, but in general, I think people have to really... Um, realize there's no right or wrong way to handle the holidays. A lot of people look forward to this. It's one of the most exciting times of year for many, but for, for, for lots of folks, it's very challenging. Um, and yes, I'll add COVID to the mix in terms of the dynamics around that, especially this year and, and last year as well. Um, people have to make adjustments according to their status, as it were. So for example, and this is not to get political on any level. I understand. Just, just to understand that for people who are unvaccinated, for example, and they have either el elderly relatives or are visiting very young children, babies, infants. Colette, I think you might know a little bit about that. Uh, th <laughs> there may be some hesitancy on the family's part to have the person join in person. And I think that that has to be sort of accepted and dealt with and and prepped for in advance hopefully there's open communication around that and and people can and work around that as much as possible and that's where this comes into play this meaning what we're doing now sometimes the people are brought in remotely and it's a different vibe it's a different type of setup but it's something that if you prepare yourself for can make it at least approximate what it's like to be in person but this this COVID situation, and you know, we don't know what's going to happen with this new variant. There's also a lot of back and forth with that, but there is some fear uh, on that end for, for some folks, not for all, but it does affect your ability to engage in person. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to think about. The other thing I'm thinking about is the empty chair, which exists, or, or unfortunately could be number of chairs, which can exist any year. But I think especially for, for uh, elderly folks who, who have succumbed to this disease or for other reasons, 
uh, it, it's going to highlight um, the loss if you are in person, even if it's virtual. So coping with that and realizing that, you know, it's a proverb, you'll do the best you can under these circumstances. It's going to be much different this year for many people, even under the best of circumstances. Yeah, these are the worst. These are the worst of circumstances. So what I suggest that people do, if you have a loved one to lean on, lean on them while you're in these situations, hold their hand if possible, literally hold their hand through it so that you don't feel alone. And if you don't have that ability to do it, try to connect in whatever level you can emotionally, psychologically, spiritually with the people around you that you love and care about so that it makes the experience manageable. Yeah. And that's really all one can hope for in, in a situation like the empty chair or chairs. And the other thing I suggest to people for people who have challenges, again, people love this time of year, but for people who don't, is to realize there's a beginning, middle and end to it. Mm -hmm. That if you really are freaked out about, you know, the, you know, the classic example is the uncle who eats or drinks too much and kind of collapses on the sofa or the chair and maybe says silly things during the course of the dinner, which makes you roll your eyes. Just realize you could probably be in and out of there, you know, two, three hours, and then the night's over. You can go home and decompress either by yourself or with a loved one and do a little bit of a it's done with and uh, on to next year. So I, it, it's just a variety of ways of approaching this, but that's what I would, I would say. Those are the sort of main bullet points that people I think deal with around the holidays. I like that too, the beginning, middle and end. Cause I feel like when you're in that situation and you feel vulnerable, right? Or pressure or uncomfortable, it's hard to think like, hey, like there's a beginning, middle and end. But if you can remind yourself that like, this is going to end, this isn't gonna be, for the rest of this year, right? Or the rest of my life. It's just this dinner right now. I think probably gives a lot of grounding. Absolutely. It's a slice to the afternoon or evening and that's it, depending yeah. on what things get, get yeah. rolling. Yeah. And I also suggest that people prepare in advance for that fact. If you have it ingrained in that, and this is something you can meditate on, pray on if you believe in it, talk about all of the above, think about it a little beforehand so that when you get involved in the, in the event, it seems a little less uh, onerous, a little less uh, stressful, and you're more likely to get through it a little bit easier. I love that. Awesome. Perfect. Um, so on to the next question, because this definitely relates to the first question, uh -huh. but um, a little different. How has your practice, I know my practice has changed, but how has your practice changed since COVID? Well, primarily what I alluded to in the beginning and sort of what we're doing now, then I, I'm, I am working uh remotely and virtually and that that is a factor that uh definitely influences the practice in many respects i think i do have a little bit of a leg up in doing this in that i've been working a lot uh with things like zoom and other remote uh avenues really probably for about 10 years or so because I, I i work with a lot of uh say seniors in high school Let's say we hit it off and we form a good relationship and oftentimes they go away to school mm -hmm. and I'll continue to therapy uh, while they're away in school. And we have to do it remotely, especially, you know, most oftentimes they're not local. They can be all, all over the state, sometimes out of the state. So we'll do it remotely. And back, you know, back in the day, we used to do, uh, oh God, the name escapes me. Another popular platform that used to be utilized it was a big one. That's still you, less than Zoom. And I can't think of the name right now. I'll figure it out. Yeah, it'll come to you, hopefully come to one of us. But, you know, just basically an online platform. And then uh, what I would do is see the folks in person when they were on school breaks mm. or in the summer. So that definitely is in, informed it just on a logistical level. Yeah. But I, I've gotten very comfortable with it. And so have my clients, because it's benefited a lot of the people, I think especially that, uh, are working remotely and it makes it easier for them not having to deal with a commute to an office. Yeah. Some folks that have to deal with, uh, you know, childcare, babysitting makes it a little bit easier not to have to leave the home. Uh, the other factor is the anxiety level is through the roof for so many folks that are either have experienced COVID or loved ones that have gone through it, or they, as I mentioned earlier, they may have lost loved ones, or just anxiety and anticipatory anxiety around COVID has really, uh, I imagine you've seen this as well, Colette, yeah. it's really thrown people into a tizzy. Um, 
there's a lot of, you know, fear based on the changing protocols. Do I mask? Right. Do I not mask? What are the rules today? What, yep. So it leads to a little bit of obsessiveness around this for people all, who already have, say, health anxiety and sort of obsessive tendencies. It's yeah. is not a good cocktail mix. So that's a factor that actually leads people into treatment, I believe. Or for people that are already in it, it's another layer added to their stress. Yeah. So you definitely feel it. I feel it. Of course. Oh, I agree. You know, I found this study and I'll look for it later on tonight. I have to send it to you. I might've told you about this, but it was this awesome study that talked about um, how online remote therapy is actually more beneficial than in person, specifically CBT and exposure therapy. And a lot of the reasons you're talking about, right? Like in, I mean, obviously it depends on the circumstance, but being in your home, right. And feeling safe, there's not that commute or that pressure to get to that appointment or even the clinician, right? I mean, it's like very, so I'll definitely share that with you. Uh, And the other thing I add too is, so some of my clients want to do video and some prefer phone and I totally get it, right? After a while of being on Zoom all day long for work, they're like, I can't look at a video for another minute. Um, And I just kind of love that idea of the old school going back to the phone and like no pressure, Let's just talk, right? Let's just, let's just. I find that the same. Sometimes it's by default because the Zoom connection is weak. So far, so good with us here, but sometimes we lose connection. The Wi Fi is weak. They're calling from their cars sometimes because they're on Mm -hmm. a lunch break um, for those that do go into an office. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting mix. But I think, you know, mentioning men, especially, sometimes men, you know, will oftentimes reluctantly engage in therapy and oftentimes pushed by a significant other. Mm. So I've found that it's a lot less threatening for them yes. to go into the doctor's office. As yeah. it were. It's, yeah. it's always associated as, as much as I try to make my office welcoming and comforting, they still see it as seeing the doc. And yeah. when it's like this and, you know, hopefully, you know, I come across as somewhat authentic and real and, yes. and uh, you know, engageable, it's, it's much less threatening to these gentlemen. And, and I, I find that they engage a lot more readily than that, especially in the first couple of sessions. And those couple of sessions, I'm sure you know, can make or break. Oh, yeah. Engagement. I agree. Anxieties through the roof. If they, they're just freaked out about maybe being seen in, yeah. in an office, they may run into somebody exactly. in a working area that they know they don't have to deal with that. So that's another added sort of factor. Yeah. I love that. I'll definitely find that article later. Yeah, I appreciate it. that. That's great. It's a really, yeah, very interesting. Um, the other question that I have for you now is kind of switching gears a little bit from individual um, to talking about couples, but what is your approach to couples therapy? Uh, just to distill it down, because I know we don't have a ton of time. I could go on, on, on about this for hours, but essentially, um, if I had to distill it down to its <laughs> finest point, It's really having, first of all, it's not setting an agenda for the couple. I don't have an agenda in people staying together or or separating or divorcing. Obviously in a perfect world, we want everyone to stay together. But my, my goal is for people to gain clarity. And because they come to me because they're not clear. Mm-hmm. sometimes they just want fine tuning not just but they want fine tuning and they're clear that they want to stay together for a whole slew of reasons but oftentimes they're on the fence so I, my hope is that I help them get off the fence and gain clarity one way or the other and and the primary mode that I utilize is, is based uh, on on a theory developed by Harville Hendricks Imago relations therapy therapy I mean obviously I'm just using myself in conjunction with it and I'm not wedded to any one principle whatever we, we kind of go with the flow sort of what we're doing now yeah but Taylor. The pri- yeah, but the primary mode is to put yourself in the position of your partner. I like to call it what people do is, especially in a couple situation, but sometimes individually, is they get, as I call, righteously indignant. It's like they, they get fixed in their position and they're trying to prove, it's in the case of myself, they're trying to prove me right. Mm-hmm. They're right and they're wrong. And I want, and they want to sell me on their position. And, that, and that's where I think I can come into play. It's like, this yeah. is not a sales pitch. This is more about understanding where your partner is coming from, exactly. not your position and vice versa. So what happens is the partners then speak for each other 
which is much different than you digging in your heels. The, the whole idea is, is to become more empathetic and understanding of why your partner operates the way they do. Yeah. And we get into some techniques around, you know, background, history, you know, we all have different ones based on a whole slew of facts, well, to be two different people, right? Yeah. We're going to have two different histories. So it's mainly about putting yourself in the shoes of your partner and be, doing more listening than talking. Yeah, listening to listen versus listening to respond. Love that. Oh yeah, that's great. Love that. Totally so I'm gonna backtrack a little bit because I, I forgot to ask you this question, like personally with remote, but what is the experience for you? Like, how do you describe the experience of doing remote therapy? maybe to a client or even for yourself. Like, you know, I mean, we talked about how it's sort of changed in your practice. Right. I, I, I it fundamentally works for me, to be honest with you. I, I think that um, I like the idea of doing it from a home office. Mm -hmm. um, simple things like big temperature control, not having to worry about that in an office building yeah. where things, things go south sometimes, too warm, yeah. too cold. I've, I have complete control over that you know, own bathroom, own fridge, you know, it, it does make a difference in terms yeah. of my own comfort. And quite frankly, I found that when I do this, I, I can cut back on the back to back to back to back to back situation, which oftentimes was the case uh, in the office for, for practical reasons. Yeah, sure. um, I'm, le I'm less burnt by it, less stress by it. And I find that I can cut down on the amount of people that I see. And I think it benefits everyone. I agree. I'm, I'm much more present, especially for the late night folks. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, I talk about the late night folks that why Jim, Jimmy Kimmel, they may watch Jimmy Kimmel at 1230. Sometimes I kiss up on him pretty late, late hours, but yeah. I've, I've been able to scale back on that. And I think that I'm much more present for the late, late night people. And they, they've noticed it actually. I think I, I agree too for myself. I wonder, I think this is sort of like the way the world's going. I think it's all going to be remote inevitably. What do you think? It may be. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about all, but I think it's moving in that direction because again, even with this, this latest variant, this Omicron variant, yeah. there's this talk about not so fast about, go, at least in New York, not so fast about going back into the office. Yep. Because it's a concern you're going to have to pull back again. Exactly. So I think that people have found their footing for those, not some jobs you can't do yeah. remotely, but I think one of the things that people have learned is that many can be done remotely. Yeah. And um, uh, I think people who are in the, in, in the workforce, for the most part, appreciate it. They also like the fact that they don't have to deal with commuting and yeah. all the issues that benefit me benefit them. So I think where it can be done, it will be. Some things obviously can't can't be done. Yeah, remotely. but I think we're moving much more and more towards that. It's becoming, as they say, the new normal. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there's been tons of times where I've had the plan right that I'm going to go back in person, and then something happens, and there's a new variant, and the plan kind of takes back a little bit. And I have to be honest, I think only one of my clients have asked, like, "Hey, are you going back in person?" Everybody else is very content for the very reasons that you're sharing right now being remote right. it just, same it, it works yeah it works and especially when they see that it's a norm that yes. they understand that that's sort of the way of the world we, we work in it and they see it in their own world yeah fundamentally not all there's a clinician that i know um who has been doing online forever i mean forever 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 and um you know, obviously 10 years ago, 15 years ago, like that wasn't the norm, right? And now you're right. It's like, that's the new norm. And like all clinicians are online basically. And 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 many, many, uh, you know, jobs are that were not considered to be that. Again, Every some job. can't, you know, obviously you're not going to drive a truck online, although yeah. that would be, who knows what's going to happen 10 years down the road. You know? <laughs> I was going to say, self, we'll come back to that in 10 years. With self-driving cars, you know, there could be <laughs> self-driving, you know, semi, semis. So who knows? But, um, you know, I think if there was one challenge, I would say, Colette, and I really feel like it's it's working well, it, mm -hmm. is a hy hypnosis. Because mm. that, that was a new thing for me to do online, but it really does work. It works, yeah. I find if the energy, we, we transfer energy to different different means and as long as I have the visual and I, I the nonverbal comes across as well 
in terms of facial expressions. I could tell when people's eyes are fluttering, so you yeah. know they're in a deep trance. It's all visual. Wow, that's awesome. So yeah, I find that it's beneficial, and I've got, had no complaints from my clients around it. Yeah, even with distance Reiki. I mean, at first I was a little bit hesitant, um, yeah. but I, I love doing it. I think I, if anything, I think it's more powerful than it is in person, believe it or not. So it's, yeah, I don't know a lot about Reiki, but my understanding of distance Reiki has been going on for a while. Oh, it's forever. Over, forever. Right? Yeah, I'll send That's you so much with hypnosis. That's okay. relatively a new thing. So. Um, so I want the last question I want to ask you is, and, and, and I really like this question. I think this is a fun one, but um, they're all fun, actually. How do you use silence as a therapeutic, excuse me, therapeutic tool in therapy? Well, I think, you know, the expression of silence is golden. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have to look at Freud for that. That that I guess uh, I could look to my grandma, rest in peace for that. I mean, she didn't invent it, but she certainly believed in it. Uh, at times, obviously, with someone yeah. like me, it didn't always work as a little guy because I couldn't stop yapping. But <laughs> so, you know, it, was, it was the children should be seen but not he uh, heard here. Right? It's a lot different now, yeah. uh, thankfully, actually. But, you know, I think we have to be uh, comfortable with pauses. I think sometimes there's a desire to sort of fill in the gaps. And I, I think a lot of clinicians, especially the ones that are starting out, uh, feel like they have to be saying something in order to accomplish accomplish something great mm -hmm. and you know if you've ever you know you have we've all been on the other end of it just somebody listening intently and Absolutely. and and allowing for those pardon the pun pregnant pauses to 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 manifest themselves they could be as much depth or sometimes more depth than that than the actual verbal salad that sometimes <laughs> comes out I from agree. all of us. And then you know, there's a tendency for helpers to feel like you always have to intervene and say something of value yeah. or incredible value, maybe. And oftentimes the greatest value is just, just letting things sit, yep. letting it marinate. And because, but that take, in my experience, that takes a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. so I know when I first started doing this work a hundred years ago, there was a tendency to be, you know, fill in the gaps yeah. quickly because I couldn't stand the silence. Like yeah. what's wrong? Am I not saying what, you know, something right yeah. or like, yeah. are they shutting down and realize what they're doing is just, you know, turning within yeah. reflecting the in the moment and don't, don't disrupt that. It's almost like short circuiting something very, very significant. If you, if you, intervene prematurely so i think silence is critical i agree Absolutely i agree critical i have a um a, a clinician that works with me who is a limited permit um so i supervise her and this is a conversation we had before and i remember maybe not a hundred years ago maybe 50 years ago <laughs> when i started I got like you i remember that that silence being so uncomfortable and now i'm like that silence is everything give it the floor like let it take the power it, oh, i love that give it the floor yeah give it its give it its due yes exactly invite it in um so wow that went fast we are at time it always so, flies with you Colette. always flies but you and me could talk for hours we could do this no all day. we could do it offline maybe <laughs> But seriously, Joel, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for sharing so much with the viewers, so much with me. It's always an amazing experience talking to you, interviewing you, and, and abundancy of knowledge. And I no, uh, Colette, you. seriously, and I mean this sincerely. This is always a pleasure with always. you. And you're also doing a great service to the community by doing this and having, you know, a wide array of folks that you interview and sort of put it out there and make great use of this medium in terms of, you know, allowing people to, you know, experience uh, different perspectives yeah. on things. So it's, it's really a wonderful thing that you're doing. And again, I, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity. Thank you, Once my again. friend. Thank you so much. Hopefully we'll have you back on again. Until next time, love, light, and healing. Thank you. Thank you.